What's wrong with the Duhem-Quine thesis? If you are fairly familiar with issues in the philosophy of science, especially questions surrounding scientific realism, you're likely to be familiar with what is known as the Duhem-Quine thesis, and it is likely that you have some fairly strong feelings about it one way or the other. Knowing that there are at least a few people listening to this who may not be familiar with it, some background material is appropriate. Pierre Duhem, in 1906, published The Aim and Structure of Physical Theory. In it, he suggests that individual theories cannot be tested directly. He goes to some length to criticize a view, which ex he expresses in the following way. So long as the experiment lasts, the theory should remain waiting under strict orders to stay outside the door of the laboratory. Such a view was, at the time, as well as today, understood to be the basic understanding as to how science ought to proceed. Theory is something that can only come at the end of our data gathering, and never before. The problem with this, as Duhem pointed out, is that theory is already interwoven with every element of a laboratory equipment. In physics, in fact, it is impossible to leave outside the laboratory door the theory that we wish to test, for without theory it is impossible to regulate a single instrument or to interpret a single reading. If we are not to appeal to theory during the experiment, we can never develop a helpful experiment in the first place. Every experiment relies on a host of theoretical considerations which are taken for granted during the duration of the experiment. If this point is granted, it has cataclysmic implications for crucial experiments. Crucial experiments are the way that scientists are thought to be able to make a decision between two competing theories which, as yet, can deal with the facts equally well. To find out which theory is better, an experiment is designed for which the different theories predict different outcomes. The goal is that such an experiment will infallibly rule out at least one of the alternatives from consideration. Duhem's point is that the failure of an experiment to give the result expected by the theory does not necessarily mean the theory under explicit consideration is false. It could very well be the case that something else is wrong in the system. It might be that there is something wrong with the instruments being used to gather the data, in which case the fault would lie there. It might also be the case that some other theoretical element that is being assumed, viewed as already established and no longer under question, might not be as certain as we previously thought. The point is that the negative result of an experiment does not necessarily refute any particular element of the theoretical system. What this means is that when we construct a so-called crucial experiment, we're not testing between two theories, but between two theoretical systems. This idea is given expression decades later by Imre Lakatos when he says that it is not that we propose a theory and nature may shout no, rather we propose a maze of theories and nature may shout inconsistent. Crucial experiments only really do what we hope they will do when they share a common set of background assumptions. Now this sounds awfully dramatic, but with the work of people like Thomas Kuhn and his notion of paradigms and paradigm shifts, it really is precisely what we would expect. We may test whether one theory is a better choice than another, not in an absolute sense, but in one that is relative to a particular paradigm. This means that, if and when the paradigm shifts, we may need to revisit some of the same questions and experiments again to consider whether they might lead us to believe something different when considered against a different conceptual background. Duhem's thesis is relatively modest, and many people are comparatively prepared to accept it. A few decades later, however, W. V. O. Quine developed it in a direction that has met with more resistance as it seems to be a far more radical form of the thesis. In his important essay, The Two Dogmas of Empiricism, Quine makes the following bold claim. A conflict with experience at the periphery occasions readjustments in the interior of the field. Truth values have to be redistributed over some of our statements. Re-evaluation of some statements entails re-evaluation of others because of their logical interconnections. The logical laws being in turn simply further, certain further statements of the system, certain further elements of the field. Having re-evaluated one statement, we must re-evaluate some others, which may be statements logically connected with the first, or may be the statements of logical connections themselves. But the total field is so underdetermined by its boundary conditions, experience, that there is much latitude of choice as to what statements to re-evaluate in the light of any single contrary experience. No particular experiences are, are linked with any particular statements in the interior of the field except indirectly through considerations of equilibrium affecting the field as a whole. 
The version of the statement, which gets quoted with some frequency, highlighting its radical-sounding character, is that any statement can be held true come what may if we make drastic enough adjustments elsewhere in the system. This sounds quite offensive to ears who have been told with some frequency that the reason why science is superior to other ways of thinking is because it is falsifiable. Duham had argued that, though falsification was not as obvious as it seemed, it is still possible to rule out systems of theories and decide between conflicting theories within a given theoretical framework. Quine, by contrast, was saying that it is not possible to strictly and unambiguously falsify any particular statement. This has been a difficult pill to swallow for many people. While many philosophers have accepted the argument and its implications, there are many others, as is to be expected, who find to be far too radical. It's easy to put an argument against it like this. Quine claims that individual hypotheses are not ultimately falsifiable. However, we can see from experience that hypotheses are indeed falsified. Therefore, Quine is mistaken and his thesis is false. That is quite an appealing argument. However, it trades on the assumption that, when a hypothesis is falsified, it is so absolutely, and not only relatively, which is precisely the issue in question. If this argument is to have any force, one must make it clear that individual theoretical claims can be isolated from the rest of their theoretical system, something which is proven to be very difficult, if not impossible, to do. Much ink has been spilled over whether the Duhem quine thesis, especially Quine's version of it, is valid or not. And I will not attempt to introduce that discussion or decide between competing views. Rather, I hope to look at how we actually behave in various fields and to examine what the Duhem quine thesis does not claim, which seems to me as to be as significant as what it does claim. However, before we do so, I would like to put Quine's version of the thesis in a somewhat more formal language, as it will make it easier to discuss the issues clearly and concisely. Quine's theory, thesis can be rendered like this. Within any system A, S, any hypothesis H can be maintained, come what may, provided we make sufficient changes in the rest of S. In point of fact, we actually behave consistently with Quine's thesis on a regular basis. In any given field, there are certain claims that we are more willing to give up than others, which means that there are certain claims which we are less willing to abandon than others. The well-known practice of making ad hoc modifications to a theory is an example of doing precisely what Quine says that we do, even if only to a relatively moderate degree. We have a theoretical system, S, which we like and which has proven to be quite useful. However, we have an experience or we observe a phenomenon which seems to count against a crucial element of the theory, H. If we are unwilling to abandon H, we will make adjustments to the rest of S so we can maintain it. When considered in abstract terms, this might seem counterintuitive, so a historical example is appropriate. The basis of Ptolemaic cosmology was that the Earth is the center of the universe. The sun, planets, and stars all rotate around the Earth. In modern times, this has been rejected as if it were an utterly naive thing to believe, but it is per in, perfectly in line with common sense. We certainly do not feel as though we are hurtling through space at high speeds. When we note that the Ptolemaic astronomers were able to explain the movements of the heavens in a way that was deemed acceptable to their theory, we can see how deeply Quinean the long rejection of Copernican astronomy really was. Geocentrism was seen as being established and certain. Scientists committed to the Ptolemaic system had made many very convincing arguments as to why the Earth could not be spinning or moving like Copernicus claimed it was. It was, to many people, the one piece of scientific information they could be absolutely certain of. Copernican astronomy requ required that they give it up in favor of something far less intuitive and self-evident. Rather than give up the centrality of the Earth, scientists made adjustments, great and small, to their system, adding epicycles to the paths of planets and stars to bring the theory into alignment with observation. Using the terminology above, we can say that our system S is the Ptolemaic astronomy, and that our hypothesis H, which we want to preserve, is geocentrism. A mountain of evidence was raised against H, but rather than abandoning H, a multitude of adjustments were made to the rest of S. It could be said that H was only abandoned when the modifications to S finally seemed less plausible uh, than the rival system S prime, Copernican astronomy. This is perhaps why Quine's thesis seems so improbable to many. We simply do not see the entire scientific community being pushed to the extreme case often, if ever. There seems to always be a time when the majority of the scientific community becomes dissatisfied with the adjustments made to S that they eventually become willing to reject H. There comes a point where it becomes even more cumbersome to manipulate S than to accept S prime, and so a change is made. However, it must be noted that this is a pragmatic move, which is motivated in part by psychological and sociological factors as much as evidential ones. 
there was no reason why one would have to abandon the Ptolemaic system for the Copernican one. Indeed, it is one of the ironies of history that, with the advent of general relativity physics, geocentrism has regained some of its scientific respectability, since we no longer believe that we may insist that one coordinate system is inherently more scientific than another. Many people are uncomfortable with the idea that we would insist on maintaining H even if it required significant changes to S. However, it's fairly easy to find such an H in various fields. A famous quotation to this effect is by Arthur Eddington. The law that entropy always increases holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Max Maxwell's equations. If it is found to be contradicted by observation, well, these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. According to Eddington, the second law of thermodynamics is utterly unfalsifiable. There's no conceivable data that could ever arise which would call it into question for him. Should some difficult experimental results come to light, Eddington could respond in several ways. He could abandon the second law, of course, but he is far more likely to dismiss the experiments as being poorly executed or claim that there are other factors at play than it would seem. Come what may, Eddington will not abandon the second law, no matter what else may be modified to preserve it. Similar arguments might be made about other core scientific convictions which are, in practice, above revision. There may come a day when S has been modified so dramatically that it strains the credulity of the scientific community. At that point, they may make the pragmatic decision to abandon H and move to S prime, but that's because scientists are a pragmatic breed, and there's not much sense in beating a dead horse. In terms of logical possibilities, however, they would not ever be utterly compelled to do this. Within the context of Christian theology, we see something like this in the development of the doctrine of the Trinity. Affirming that God is triune seems quite unintuitive and is certainly never made explicit in the biblical record. Why in the world, then, would the Christian tradition develop such a doctrine and, not only that, insist that it must be maintained throughout the ages? The reason is because, for the Christian church, their hypothesis H, which they will maintain at all costs, come what may, is that in Jesus Christ we have come to meet with the fullness of God in human flesh. When this becomes our Quinean H... It means that it must trump any and every alternative consideration, regardless of what must be modified elsewhere. That this is a radical commitment is made quite clear in the doctrine of the Trinity. The Christian tradition, which was utterly committed to the monotheism of ancient Judaism, was willing to make rather dramatic adjustments to their doctrine of God, rather than give up their Christological convictions. When faced with a host of challenges from the Greco-Roman world which balked at the idea that Jesus could truly be both God and human, such as we see in modalism, Arianism, Nestorianism, and monophysitism, the Church responded by refusing to relinquish H, being more sure of that than of the criticisms being launched against it. It should be noted, however, that Quine's thesis is not actually as destructive as one might think. It claims that in any system we are able to maintain any particular hypothesis H come what may. What it does not grant is that we are able to maintain a series of hypotheses, H1, H2, H3, etc. Indeed, we are not even guaranteed that we can preserve two hypotheses, H1 and H2 come what may. We are only allowed to preserve a single hypothesis. What this means is that, while we are allowed to have a system with either an irresistible force or an immovable object, we are not permitted to have both. This means that Quine's thesis is not as radically permissive as some has feared. Not only is it the case that psychological and sociological factors will encourage a change that can be suggested but never demanded by evidence, but it is also not possible to hold whatever hypotheses one happens to choose together. Two beloved hypotheses may come into conflict. When that happens, a decision must be made. Choose H, choose H prime, or choose to abandon the entire system. In any given situation, these choices are always logically possible, but they may not always be equally psychologically appealing. It is a helpful exercise, then, and one which can surely go a long way in clarifying different perspectives and theoretical systems, to ask, what is the H which I will not give up, come what may? Do I have more than one such H which I would like to maintain? If the two were to come into conflict, what would I do? It is possible that if we were all rigorously committed to bringing these commitments to light, many disagreements would fall away and those that remained might be more clearly understood.